Hi guys and welcome to our first lesson. Today we're going to talk about the Greek alphabet. First though, we need to think for a minute about what an alphabet is. Now this might seem like an easy question to answer. It's a set of letters. For example, if you've successfully signed up for this course, you're probably familiar with the Roman alphabet, which we use to write English. And here are some examples of letters from the Greek alphabet. The name alphabet, in fact, as you may know, comes from the names of the first two Greek letters, alpha, and beta, which gives us the bet part of alphabet. But we can be a little bit more specific with our definition. An alphabet is a kind of writing system in which written symbols, which are called letters, represent individual phonemes. So what are phonemes? Well, phonemes are the basic units of sound that make up words. So for example, the a uh and the t sound, the uh and the t sound, in alphabet are examples of phonemes, and in English we represent them with the letters A and T, respectively. But alphabets aren't the only kind of writing system out there, and that's important for our purposes, because the earliest system used to write Greek was not an alphabet. In fact, the earliest Greek text that we know of uses a writing system called Linear B. Linear B was used by an early Greek people whom we refer to collectively as Mycenaeans, and the earliest examples that we have date to the 15th century BC. And we call it linear because it's discoverer Sir Arthur Evans, a British archaeologist, and this is him over here. Uh, Sir Arthur Evans noticed that it was composed sort of abstractly of individual lines, which was different from some of the pictographic scripts he'd seen before in the region. And we call it Linear B to differentiate it from an older script called Linear A, from which Linear B is probably descended. Now Linear A has never been deciphered, and we don't know what language it represents, which is one of the problems with deciphering it. But in the 1950s, Linear B was proven to be a system for writing Greek. Now Linear B is not an alphabet, as we said, but rather a syllabary. A syllabary is a kind of writing system in which written symbols represent complete syllables and not just individual phonemes. So instead of having an individual symbol for the sound t, which we saw on the last page was the letter t, linear b has different symbols for each syllable that can be formed by combining the t sound with a vowel. So for instance, the syllable ta has its own symbol, te has its own symbol, t has its own symbol, ta, and two. Each of these has its own symbol in linear b, and that means that linear b needs a lot more symbols than an alphabet does. So for example, on this tablet, we can see the Greek word tripodes, written in the upper left-hand corner, right here, which is the Greek word for tripods. So this first symbol, and it's hard to see on the tablet, but if we look down here at the reconstruction, we can see the first symbol, which stands for T. T. The second symbol gives us RE. And this third one is PO. And then we have this fourth one, which is DE. So you put them all together, and you get T, RE, PO, DE. Now, you're probably saying to yourself now, well, that doesn't say tripodes, and you're right. It says tripode. And the reason is that linear B isn't actually always a very good system for writing Greek. Almost every symbol in the linear B syllabary represents either a vowel by itself or a consonant followed by a vowel. And that means that whenever you have a consonant sound that isn't followed directly by a vowel, like the t or the s sound in tripodes, you have to do one of two things. You can add in an extra syllable, and that's what we did here, so we turned tree into tri, or you can leave out the consonant sound entirely. So we turned des into just de, and didn't represent that s sound anywhere. Now around 1200 BC, for reasons that are still debated, many of the Mycenaean centers collapsed, and linear B writing seems to have been abandoned around that time. But sometime in the early first millennium BC, Greek writing began to reappear in early versions of the Greek alphabet that's still in use today. Since the alphabet represents individual phonemes and not entire syllables, as we saw in Linear B, it only needs 24 characters, and it can still represent Greek words much more faithfully than Linear B could. So now we can write the same word tripodes like this.
So where did the Greek alphabet come from? Well, the ancient Greeks, as you may know, were fond of myths that explained the origins of things, and they had a couple of myths like this to explain the origin of their alphabet. Now one of these myths attributed the invention of the alphabet to this guy over here in the red, and that is Cadmus, a mythical founder and king of the Greek city of Thebes. So how did Cadmus come up with the Greek alphabet? Well, the 5th century BC historian Herodotus of Halicarnassus tells us that he probably learned the letters from the Phoenicians, who were an ancient people who lived on the coast of the Levant, over here on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And indeed, many of the Greek letters correspond to older Phoenician letters. So whether or not there ever was a Cadmus, Herodotus was probably at least partly right. So this first Phoenician letter, called Aleph, corresponds with the Greek Alpha. We can see the similarity there. And the second one is Bet, corresponds with Beta, and so on. Now if these names sound familiar to you, it's probably because Phoenician is a Semitic language, which isn't related to Greek, but is in the same family as Hebrew and Arabic. Phoenician has a number of characteristics in common with ancient Hebrew and Arabic, including the absence of vowels in their alphabet. Phoenicians just wrote the consonant sounds included in a word, and the reader had to be able to infer the vowel sounds that made up the rest of the word from there. When the Greeks adopted their alphabet, though, they made a few distinctive innovations. They added some letters to represent consonant sounds and double consonant sounds, and they reassigned some of the Phoenician consonants to represent vowels. So, for instance, this Phoenician consonant heth, over here, became the Greek vowel eta, which makes a long e sound. Now we should note here that the change wasn't immediately universal, and in some versions of the Greek alphabet, heth was still used as a consonant that made a h sound. And the Roman alphabet, as you might guess, is descended from one of those forms. And so that's why our letter h looks like a Greek eta, but makes an h sound. Now, a lot of other Greek letters were written differently in different places as well. So if we go back to this picture of the Gorton Law Code, which is a law code inscribed on a wall in the town of Gorton in Crete, we can see that it's written in an epicoric script, that is, a regional variant of the Greek alphabet. So for example, we can see the letter pi, which we will write like this, written here as though it's shaped like a letter C. And we can see the letter iota, which we'll write like this, like a sort of uppercase I, written here shaped like an S, sort of a curvy iota. And we can see sigma, which we will write like this, written sideways, right here, like a letter M. And sometimes this is identified as another letter san, another sibilant from the Phoenician alphabet, which makes the same S sound for the Greeks. And we also see here the letter digamma, which looks like an uppercase F, which we won't use at all, because it dropped out of the Greek alphabet by the Classical period. You should also note that all of these letters are capital, or majuscule, or uppercase. Consistent capitalization and lowercase script weren't developed in Greek until much later. Letter forms weren't the only variation within ancient Greek. There were also several different regional dialects. This is true in English, too. For example, people from Boston, like my mother, often don't use the same words or pronounce words in the same way as people from New Orleans. Unlike in English, though, these variants were regularly reflected in Greek in the spellings of words. So when the historian Xenophon tells us how a beleaguered Greek army, rejoicing to see the sea at the end of a long journey home, cried, Thalata, Thalata, we can tell right away that he's an Athenian, that is, he comes from this region of Athens and the surrounding area, because anyone else would have written Thalassa. Thalassa, for the same word, which means the sea, the sea. Fortunately for us, after the 4th century BC, Attic Greek, that dialect of Athens that Xenophon used, and the corresponding alphabet slowly became more or less standardized throughout the Greek world. And so that's the dialect we're going to learn to read. The overwhelming majority of surviving Greek literature from the classical period, that is roughly the 4th and 5th centuries, is written in Attic. 
and most subsequent written Greek was produced in an adaptation of Attic Greek called Koine, or Common Greek. Now, Koine is most famously the language of the New Testament, and here you're looking at some Koine Greek in the Codex Vaticanus, which is one of our oldest New Testament manuscripts. This here is the end of the Gospel of Luke and the beginning of John. So once you've learned Attic, you should be able to handle most of the ancient Greek texts out there without too much trouble. So without further ado, let's look at the alphabet. I suggest you pause the video and grab something to write with if you haven't already got something handy, so that you can practice drawing the letters as we go over them. And if you'd like, you can follow along on page 3 of your Alpha to Omega textbook. Now this first letter is called Alpha. Alpha, and it makes a short A sound and roughly corresponds to the Roman letter A. It makes that sound as in father, a, ah, a. Ah. Now the way to draw an alpha is for an uppercase one, I, I draw it just like an uppercase A. For a lowercase alpha, I tend to start halfway up the line, loop down, around, and back down. So you end up with two little tails there. Some people will draw an alpha this way or this way, and that's okay too, but you want it to end up looking roughly like this. An example of a Greek word with the letter alpha in it might be the verb grapho, grapho, which means I write, grapho, and you can hear the alpha in the middle there. Our second letter is called beta, beta, which as you might guess corresponds roughly to the English letter B, and it makes a B sound as in ball. Now the way I draw a beta is for an uppercase beta, just the same as an uppercase B. For a lowercase beta, I start down below the line, come all the way up to the top, loop around once, loop around again, and make sure you leave this tail down below the, the line that you're writing on. Now an example of a Greek word with the letter beta in it might be the verb blepo. Blepo, which means I look. Blepo. Next we have the Greek letter gamma, gamma, which roughly corresponds to our letter G, but always to that hard G that you get in the word game, and never to the soft G that we pronounce in the word giant. It always makes that hard G sound. The only exception is when gamma comes before another palatal consonant, and those are consonants that are formed by touching your tongue to the part of the top of your mouth called the palate. So our four palatal consonants in Greek are gamma itself, kappa, xi, and chi. So when gamma comes before one of these, it makes a kind of ng sound, as in anger. Now to draw an uppercase gamma, it's pretty easy. I draw it just like an uppercase English letter F, except without the second bar. So we draw our long bar from the bottom of the line up to the top, and then a horizontal bar, and we can stop there. To draw a lowercase gamma, I start halfway up the line, loop down, around, and back up. So it looks sort of like a Y that hangs directly down below the line, and that's where, where your line should be. Now, an example of a Greek word with that regular hard gamma that makes a G sound is the verb gignosko. Gignosko, which means I know. Gignosko. And an example of a gamma that's nasalized before a palatal might be the word angelo. Angelo, which is a verb that means I report or I announce. Or we could try the word ananke. Ananke, and there you can hear that k sound after the nasalized gamma. Nananke means necessity or compulsion. Next we have the Greek letter delta, delta, which corresponds roughly to the letter D, and it makes that D sound as in dinner. To draw an uppercase delta, we just draw a big triangle. A lowercase delta is a little bit trickier. Here's how I do it. I start at the middle of the line and make a circle. But instead of stopping my circle, I continue up around and then put a little curl on here. So when I do it fast, it looks kind of like that. And that's delta. An example of a Greek word with the letter delta 
is the verb dioko. Dioko, which means I hunt, I pursue. Next we have the letter epsilon. Epsilon. Literally, the name of the letter epsilon means simple e, or e simple. And that's what epsilon is. It's a short letter e. And epsilon is always a short vowel. It never counts as a long vowel. The long form of epsilon is represented by eta, which we'll get to in a minute. So epsilon makes that short e sound, as in the English word bet, that e eh sound. Now to draw an epsilon, an uppercase epsilon looks just like an uppercase e. For a lowercase epsilon, I tend to draw it like this, the way your font does. I start at the middle of the line and make two loops, sort of like a backwards three. You'll also see epsilons drawn in other ways, principally like this, and that's okay too. An example of a Greek word with epsilon is the verb pempo. Pempo, I send. Tempo. Next we have the Greek letter zeta. Zeta, which corresponds roughly to our English letter Z, but it doesn't sound quite the way the English Z sounds. Instead, zeta is made up of two consonant sounds, an S followed by a D, and that's a voiced S that makes a Z sound, or the way we pronounce it sometimes, a D followed by an S. So it can sound as in the word wisdom, that zd sound, or as in gadzooks, where you get that z kind of sound. Now the way we draw a zeta, this one's a little bit tricky. In the uppercase, of course, it just looks like an uppercase Z, but in the lowercase, here's how I do it. I start with a sort of horizontal line, and you can make that curvy if you want, then a big curve down and a little curly cue for the tail. So horizontal line, big curl down, and a curly cue for the tail. And that, and that curly cue should go underneath the line you're writing on. Now, an example of a Greek word with zeta in it might be the verb zeteo, zeteo, which means I look for, I seek. The next letter we have is eta. Eta, and you'll remember eta because it's that adaptation of the, the Phoenician letter heth, um, which became a Greek consonant. Now eta makes a long e sound in Greek. And originally, this sound was sort of like the epsilon, but held for twice as long. And that's how long letters worked in classical Greek. They were just like short letters, but held twice as long. So we can represent the original sound of eta sort of like the e in error error, which we hold a little bit longer than a normal short e. But the way we pronounce it nowadays in our reconstructed or what's called Erasmian pronunciation uh, tends to be closer to a long a sound, so like the a in ace. And that's how we'll pronounce eta in this class, as a. Now to draw an eta, an uppercase eta, just looks like a letter h for reasons we've discussed. A lowercase eta is a little different, so we start at the middle of the line, and start like we're going to draw an N, but then we make the second bar of the N drop down below the line. Now an example of a Greek word with eta in it is the word ede, ede, which means already. The next letter we have going in order is theta. Now theta is in origin the aspirated form of the letter tau, or the sound. So that means that you get your t sound followed by um, exhalation, a kind of rough breathing. So it, it would really sound like t, t. But again, we have a more modern convention for how to pronounce theta that develops uh, later on in, in classical Greek, and that is to pronounce it like the English unvoiced th, that is th, th. So where it would originally have sounded like the th in sweetheart, where they make two distinguishable sounds. Now we pronounce it as the th in author. Th, th. Now the way we draw theta is pretty easy. We just draw a big circle and a bar across it. And for a lowercase theta, we can make that circle a little thinner. The bar across it. An example of a Greek word with theta in it is the verb ethelo. 
Othello, which of course in its original kind of pronunciation would have been more like Othello, and it means I am willing or I wish. Now our next letter is Iota. Iota. And Iota roughly corresponds to the English letter I. Now unlike Ada, Iota can be long or short. We pronounce a long iota, we tend to pronounce it like that long e sound, as in pizza. And a short iota, we tend to pronounce as a short i in English, as in pit. Now in some words, you'll also see iota acting sort of like a consonant, and in that case we pronounce it like a, the letter y in yodel, like a y sound. And the way we draw an iota is pretty simple. An uppercase iota just looks like an English letter i, and you can put your little serifs on here if you want to. A lowercase iota uh, looks like a lowercase i in English, but we don't put the dot. Okay, sometimes you'll see an iota with a mark over it like this, or as in the name like this, or like this. Uh, but those mean something else, so we never dot our iotas in Greek. An example of a Greek word with iota in it uh, is the verb pistewo. Pistewo, I believe, or I trust. And uh, that's a short iota in this, in pistewo over here. This is a short iota, and it's making that i sound. An example of a word with a long iota is the adjective that we've seen before. Psilos. Psilos. And we put this mark over the iota to show that it's long. That's called a macron. Our next letter is kappa. Kappa, which corresponds roughly to the English letter K, or to that hard C. Never to a soft C, but always to a hard C that makes that K sound. K, as in cat. Now kappa, uh, we draw sort of just like an English letter K. So for an uppercase one, we just draw letter K. For a lowercase one, in this font we have it sort of curly, so it looks sort of like this. And that's okay. I tend to draw my lowercase kappas just as a small letter K. So a letter K that comes only halfway up the line. And that's fine too. You'll see them that way in some fonts. A Greek word with kappa in it is the word hekaton. Hekaton. That means 100. Next up we have lambda. Lambda, and that corresponds roughly to the English letter L, as in land. Now lambda we draw a little bit differently from an L though. So an uppercase lambda just looks like a big triangle without the bottom bar. And again you can put these little serifs on the bottom if you want to. Don't close the bottom of the lambda though. You have to leave this space open or it'll look like a, a delta. For lowercase lambda, I like to start with the shorter bar and then kind of cross it with the longer bar like that. And sometimes when I'm writing quickly, you'll see me write a lambda like this, and that's okay too. Uh, an example of a Greek word with lambda is the verb lambano, lambano, uh, which means I take, I seize, and you can hear that l, l sound at the beginning, lambano. Next we have mu. Now mu, as you might guess, corresponds to the English letter M. And it makes an M sound. With our lips together, that M sound, as in mitten. To draw uh, uppercase mu, we just draw it the same way as we draw an uppercase M. To draw lowercase mu, though, we start down below the line, come up, and then we kind of make a U with a little tail. And it's important to get these tails in here, because if you don't have them, it can look like you've got a letter U here. When I see them in there, they remind me of the bars of the M, we can see up here. And so that helps me remember to pronounce it as an M sound. So don't let yourself get confused. Now an example of a Greek word with mu in it is the adjective megas. Which we write like this. Megas, and it means big or great. And you can see the moo here on the beginning, making that m sound. Next we have nu. A nu corresponds roughly to the English letter n, and indeed it makes an n sound, as in ninja. A nu can be a little bit tricky. An uppercase nu looks just like a letter n, but a lowercase nu looks a lot like a letter v, and I draw it kind of the same way. So when you see a nu, you have to remember very carefully that 
it's making an N sound and not a V sound. And in fact, one way to help you with this is that there is no letter in classical Greek that made a V sound, that V sound. In modern Greek and in Byzantine Greek, beta made a V sound instead of a B. But in classical Greek, there's no sound that makes that V sound. So we should always remember to pronounce our nu as an N, N. An example of a Greek word with nu in it is the word nomos. nomos, which means custom or law. And you can see that nu at the beginning making an N sound, nomos. Next up we have our letter xai, xai. And that roughly works the way an English letter X does. It's another of our double consonants, just like the X in English. And so the sound you're getting is sort of that K plus S sound, or kappa plus sigma. And you can still hear both of those sounds pretty distinctly in the pronunciation of xai. It makes the X sound as in our English word taxi. To draw xai is a little bit difficult. An uppercase one's not too hard. You just draw three parallel lines where the middle one is shorter. And you can put these serifs on if you want to, but again, you don't have to. To draw a lowercase xai, we do it sort of the way we did a zeta. We draw a horizontal bar, but now we kind of make a backwards three or an epsilon before we add our curly Q. So there's basically sort of one extra little point on our xai. An example of a Greek word, an important Greek word with xai, is the word xenos. Xenos. It means foreigner. Our next letter is omicron. Omicron, and the name literally means o, micron. Small o. And omicron is another of our vowels that's always short. It always makes a short o sound, as in dot or log. And this is contrasted with omega, which we'll get to in, the, in a minute, which makes that long o sound, o. To draw an omicron is pretty easy. We draw an uppercase omicron like an uppercase o, and a lowercase omicron like a lowercase o. An example of a word with omicron, although we've seen some already, is the word oros. Oros, which means mountain. Next we have the letter pi, which you're probably familiar with from some geometry classes. Now pi in Greek just makes a p sound, as in pop. To draw an uppercase pi, I tend to sort of shortcut and draw our vertical bar, horizontal bar, and then come back down on a vertical bar. And I'll do this for lowercase pi's as well, but just make them not come up as far. But if you want to draw a little nicer one, you can draw your vertical bars and then sort of cross them with the horizontal bar. Um, it's really up to you, and all of those would be recognized uh, in different fonts. Now an example of a Greek word with pi in it is the verb pipto. Pipto, which means I fall. Pipto, and you can hear the pi making that p sound. Next we have the letter rho, which roughly corresponds to our letter r. Now, in, originally in classical Greek, this would have been pronounced as a rolled R, that r, r sound that you get in Spanish. When you're pronouncing it in ancient Greek, though, and for our, for our purposes, we can pronounce it, if you'd rather, just as a regular R sound, as in English, so as in Roger. And either way you want to pronounce it is, is fine for our purposes. Now, when rho is at the beginning of a word, it has a sort of special property, which is that it always comes with an H sound attached to it, and makes instead a sort of hra, hra sound. An example of a Greek word with a rho at the beginning is the word hrator, hrator, and we'll come back to that one a little later. Hrator, and you can hear that H sound coming in there. A Greek word with rho in the middle of the word is kore, kore which means young woman or maiden, and can also be a name of Persephone, the daughter of Demeter. Kore, or daughter, it can mean daughter as well. Now, to draw a row, it's pretty easy. We just draw it the way we draw an uppercase P, and this is another one that can confuse you because you'll see it and want to make a P sound, but you have to remember that in Greek, this letter is rho, and it makes a r sound, or a r sound. If we want to make a letter P sound, we use pi. To draw a lowercase rho, we do almost the same thing. We start below the line, come up and curl around. 
And in some fonts, you'll see a row with a little curly Q added on here, so it'll look like sort of like this. And this can confuse you. It looks a little like a beta, but it'll be hanging down below the line, so you should be able to tell the difference. All right, next up we have sigma. Sigma. And sigma corresponds roughly to the English letter S, which is pretty straightforward and easy. It just makes a s sibilant s sound, like a hissing sound between your tongue and your teeth as in simple in English. The tricky part about sigma is drawing a sigma because there are several different ways to do it. So over here these first two examples you have are an uppercase sigma which we draw like this. We draw a horizontal bar, one diagonal in, diagonal out, and another horizontal bar. And we have our lowercase sigma which we draw like this. I, I tend to draw a circle and then your bar out. Some people will draw it like this and that's fine too. Now we also have this alternate form, and this is the form of sigma that gets written at the end of a word, and only at the end of a word. We never draw this sigma in the middle of a word. And so to draw that one, we just draw it kind of like well, an English letter S, but it hangs down a little bit below the line, the line being here. So we sort of draw a letter C with a curly Q on the bottom. Now you'll also see sigma written as just a letter C very often. Uh, and this is called a lunate sigma. Lunate from the Latin for moon because it looks kind of like a crescent moon and just looks like a letter C. When you have fonts that use a lunate sigma, often they won't distinguish between this uh, this kind of sigma and the kind that comes at the end of a word. And so you'll see this uh, lunate sigma even at the end of words. So an example of a word with sigma is the noun Sophia. Sophia which means wisdom. And a word with sigma at the end is the noun polis. Polis, which means city or city-state. So if we were to draw either of these words in a, a font with a lunate sigma, and I'm running out of room here, we would write them like this. And again, you can see that there's no change between the forms when we're using the lunate sigma. Our book, though, will use these forms, and that's the one you'll see more often in printed texts nowadays. And so it's important to recognize both the uppercase and lowercase sigma uh, for the middle of a word and the terminal sigma. When we're writing all in uppercase, if we have a sigma at the end of a word, we still use the regular uppercase form. So that's sigma. There are a lot of different ways to draw it, but it always sounds as in S, as in simple. S. Next we have tau. Tau, which makes a t sound, like the letter T in English, as in tiny. To draw a tau, it's pretty easy. An uppercase tau just looks like an uppercase T. For a lowercase tau, we draw a smaller uppercase T, basically, and you can draw this little curl on the bottom if you want to. When I'm writing quickly, you'll see me skip it a lot of the time, but that's probably the most correct way to draw a tau. An example of a Greek word with tau is the word technon, which means child. Next we've got upsilon, upsilon, and this corresponds roughly to the English letter U, but sometimes also to the letter Y, and we'll talk about Y in a second. So when you're pronouncing upsilon, originally it would probably have sounded something like the French U, as in crème brûlée or something. So you get this kind of U sound. And the way to make that sound, the best way I can describe it, is to curl up your lips as though you're going to say OO, as in boo, and then try and say an E sound, a long E sound instead. So you get this kind of U, U. Now when we're pronouncing upsilon, sometimes we just pronounce it the way we pronounce a long U, as in boot in English, and that's fine too. Uh, the reason to distinguish between the two though is that we have a diphthong in Greek that is a combination of two vowels, omicron, upsilon, that makes an oo sound as in boot. And so sometimes it's useful to pronounce the upsilon as the French u, u, just to, to distinguish between those two sounds and help you remember how to spell words. The Romans, when they transliterated an upsilon, that is, when they wrote a Greek word in Latin that had an upsilon in it, they represented the upsilon not with the letter U, but with the letter Y, and they represented this diphthong with a letter U. And so that suggests that the two really did sound different in antiquity.
To draw an uppercase upsilon, we draw it just like an uppercase Y. And to draw a lowercase upsilon, we just draw it sort of like a fancy uh, lowercase u. It's important to make the bottom of your upsilon rounded enough, though, to distinguish it from the new, the new, excuse me, or it's going to make an n sound. An example of a Greek word with upsilon in it is the preposition soon, soon, which means with. And another example might be the preposition hupo. Hypo, which means under, and it's where we get our prefix hypo, like in hypodermic. Four more to go. Next we have the letter phi, phi, which is the aspirated form of pi. So it's that pi, that p sound, with an h after it, and originally would have sounded a little bit like p, as in uphill, so you'd hear both sounds distinctly. But nowadays we tend to pronounce it like a letter F, just the way we do a PH in English. And this is the way the modern Greeks pronounce it as well. So it sounds as in phony. To draw an uppercase phi, I tend to draw a whole circle and then a line down through it. Make sure this line is vertical and it can cross the circle, unlike in theta where you have your horizontal line. To draw a lowercase phi, I tend to do it all as one line and you can sort of see that in our Greek font here. So I'll start my circle here, come all the way around, and then draw a line down through. And this line should hang down below the line. An example of a Greek word with phi in it is the word philos. Philos, which means friend. Next we have our letter chi. Chi, which is again an aspirated letter, and it's the aspirated form of kappa. So it makes a k sound with that followed by a, a, a sort of escape of breath at k, and you can hear both sounds. Uh, so originally it would have sounded as in backhand. Nowadays when we're pronouncing a chi as English speakers, we sometimes have a hard time distinguishing between an aspirated and an unaspirated k sound. So sometimes you'll hear people pronounce a chi as though it's just a regular k as in kick. The other way that you can pronounce chi is the way the modern Greeks do it which is sort of as a German CH sound, and to do that you bring your tongue up to the top of your mouth as though you're going to say a K, but then you don't quite touch it to the top of your mouth and you just force smear through so you get this <laughs> sound. To draw an uppercase chi, we just draw what looks like a big X, and this can be a little bit confusing because we have to remember not to confuse chi with xi, which makes an X sound. To draw a lowercase chi, we just draw one slash bar that hangs down below the line, and then another bar down, and this should all hang below the line, and the second bar can be a little curly. When I draw a lowercase chi quickly, I tend to do my first bar uh, like the first bar of a lowercase x, and then just cross with the second bar going down the line, below the line. And that's fine too. You'll see fonts that do that. Next we have psi. Psi, which is another of our double consonants. It's not an aspirated one this time, though. Instead, it just makes a P sound plus an S sound, or a Pi sound plus a Sigma, as in upside. And you can hear both the P and the S sound in there, so ps, ps. To draw a Psi, I start with a, a U that only goes from the top of the line halfway down, and then I cross it with a vertical line. It looks a little bit like a pitchfork. To draw lowercase psi, it's the same sort of process, except your U goes from the middle of the line down to the bottom. And then we cross it, and this line should hang down below the line. An example of a Greek word with psi is the word psuche. Psuche, meaning spirit or soul. And this can be a little bit hard to pronounce for English speakers to pronounce this P and S sound at the beginning of a word. You can practice it a little by inserting a kind of vowel sound and saying a psuche, but it's good to practice so that you can really start on that P sound and, and get psuche out, psuche. So practice saying that one a couple times. I know you'll feel silly talking to your computer, but again, that's going to be a part of this class. And finally, we have omega. Now you'll remember that Omicron was a short O, and Omega just means big O. Remember our word megas, that means big. And Omega is indeed another of our vowels that's always long. 
and it's always a long O sound. Now originally in Greek, just like with eta, this would have been an O sound like an omicron that was just held for twice as long. So where it would have made an aw sound in classical Greek, where your O sound just has a longer duration, we tend to pronounce it now as in the English word O. Uh, for an uppercase omega, I start at the bottom of the line, do a horizontal line, and then a big almost closed circle, and then another horizontal line. You'll sometimes also see an omega written as just a circle hanging out above a line, so like a uh, sort of underlined floating O. But more often we'll see this omega. For a lowercase omega, this is yet another one that can, can confuse you because it looks a little bit like a curvy W, like in the Walt Disney logo. Now, you have to remember when you see this letter, there is no W in Greek. If we wanted to make that sound, we would use something like an upsilon as a consonant. So this this letter always makes a long O sound. And an example of a Greek word with an omega in it is the word soma, soma, which means body. So those are our Greek letters. Now I just want to revisit our long and short vowels for a minute. We talked a little bit about long and short vowels as we went over the letters, but to review, we have two vowels that are always short, epsilon, that's short e, and omicron, that's short o. Then we have two corresponding vowels that are always long, those are the long forms of those vowels, eta, and that's our long e, and omega, that's our long O. And that leaves three vowels that can be either long or short, and those are alpha, we can draw alpha this way, iota, and upsilon. And when we have a long alpha, iota, or upsilon, sometimes your book will distinguish it by writing a macron, one of these little horizontal lines over it. Now your textbook will do this consistently, so if you see an alpha, iota, or upsilon without the macron over it, like these ones over here, you can assume that it's a short one. Other Greek texts that you see, though, won't always do that, and so you just have to know, as part of the spelling of the word, whether your alpha, iota, or upsilon is long or short. And so that's an important thing to memorize when you're memorizing your vocabulary. The next thing we need to talk about are diphthongs. A diphthong is a kind of funny word that comes from the Greek word diphthongos. Sorry, diphthongos. And it means two sounds. And so a diphthong is a pair of vowels that are pronounced together. And your book makes a useful distinction between proper diphthongs and improper diphthongs. So there are eight proper diphthongs. Proper diphthongs generally have vowels that combine to make one sound. So we pronounce them together as one sound. It's important that you be able to spot them anywhere in a word and whether or not the first vowel is capitalized, and so I've written them both ways here. And here they are. So our first diphthong is alpha iota. An alpha iota makes an I sound, as in aisle. We pronounce that I, I, when we see alpha and iota together. Next we have alpha upsilon, and that makes an ow sound, as in ouch, ouch. Next up we have epsilon iota, and that makes an A sound, as in eight, and it sounds very similar to the way we will pronounce our eta, eight, A. Next up is epsilon upsilon, and that we pronounce uh, two different ways, really. Uh, so more originally, we would have heard kind of both sounds in there. We would have heard the e eh glide into that French u sound, so eu, eu, and that's kind of how I'll tend to pronounce it. But some people will also pronounce this u, just like the English word u. So u, and we have that in words like Europe. Next we have eta upsilon, eta upsilon, and that's just like epsilon upsilon, except that we have our long eta sound instead of our, our short epsilon sound, 
And so for this one, we really do kind of have to do the glide. And the example your book gives is, hey you. But we sort of omit the H sound in hey you and say it all together. So, hey you, hey you. Next up, we have Omicron Iota, and that makes an oi sound, as in oily. Oi. Then we have Omicron Upsilon, which we talked about a little bit, and that makes a long oo, as in ooze, or boot. And finally, we have Upsilon Iota, and that makes a sort of ooey or we sound. English word, we. Now we also have three improper diphthongs. And each improper diphthong is composed of a long vowel followed by an iota. And what they have in common is that eventually the iota stopped being pronounced. And so in an improper diphthong we have a special way of writing the iota, which is called an iota subscript. And that's this guy down here. The iota is just written as a little tail underneath the vowel, like that. So when we pronounce these diphthongs, we'll just tend to pronounce the first letter. And that's always a long vowel, alpha, eta, or omega. Remember, though, that the iota subscript is a medieval convention, so the classical Greeks never wrote an iota subscript. They always wrote it on the line, like this, or adscript, we call that. And they pronounced both letters in the diphthong. So you'd get this long alpha, and in this example, followed by an iota, so an I sound. In your book, though, you'll see the iota is written subscript consistently in an improper diphthong, except when the first letter of that improper diphthong is capitalized. And so you'll see the improper long alpha iota written this way. Now, Greek also has a number of words that start with a h sound, an h sound, followed by a vowel. Now remember that our, Greek, our version of the Greek alphabet doesn't have a letter that makes that sound, and so instead we represent it like this. We begin the word with a vowel, and if the word has an H sound before it, we write what's called an aspiration, or a rough breathing mark over it, like this, and it looks like an inverted apostrophe, so like this. So a word starting with this epsilon right here would sound like he, he at the beginning. Whenever a word starts with a vowel that is not preceded by that H sound, we instead write a smooth breathing mark over it, and that just looks like a regular apostrophe. So like this. And so a word starting with this epsilon would start eh, eh. And note that sometimes when we have a capital letter, we just write the breathing mark behind it like this. So if we look at our examples down here, this word is ananke. Ananke, and it starts without an H sound, and so we put a smooth breathing mark over the alpha. Now this next word is hecaton, which we saw before when we talked about kappa, hecaton, and that starts with a rough breathing, and so we put a rough breathing over it. It starts with that H sound, hecaton. Now next we have this word erkamai, which you can see I've written over here for when we talk about punctuation. Now, erkamai doesn't start with a uh, sound, and so we need to put a smooth breathing on it. But you'll notice it's already got this accent over the, over the epsilon, and we'll talk more about those accents in our next lesson. And what we do is we put our breathing mark right before the accent. We never put it after the accent. It always comes before. Now let's jump back a second to the letter rho. Remember that the letter rho, when it's at the beginning of the word, always comes with an H sound attached to it. And so for that reason, we always put a rough breathing mark over a rho that's at the beginning of a word. Otherwise, we only ever put breathing marks over vowels, but rho is the one exception. At the beginning of the word, it always has a rough breathing. Now, the only time a breathing mark doesn't go over the first vowel in a word is when that word begins with a diphthong. In that case, the breathing mark always goes over the second letter of the diphthong. Remember that a diphthong counts as one syllable, and so we still put that sound at the beginning of the word. So this last word means I find, and it's pronounced heurisco, and we're going to put our breathing mark right here over the upsilon, the second vowel in the diphthong, heurisco.
Now looking over at the second column, there are also four punctuation marks we need to worry about. And here I've written the word erkomai, which means I'm coming, four times to demonstrate them. So the first one is a period, which is just like the period we use in English. And that denotes the end of a sentence. And so here we have the sentence erkomai, I'm coming, all by itself. And that's the complete thought. We also use a comma in Greek. And that just works the same way the English comma does. And so here we have erkomai, which means I'm coming, and then presumably our sentence would continue. Next we have the raised dot, and this is a little bit different. This is one we don't have in English. And this can be used the same way as either a colon or a semicolon in English. It can act like either one. So here we have I'm coming, and then presumably we'd have a related thought that came afterwards. And finally, we have this mark that looks like a semicolon. And that's actually the Greek question mark. So it's important not to mix those up. Remember that if we wanted to do what we do with an English semicolon, we would use the raised dot. So this is a question mark. And so it indicates that for this last one, we have another sentence. And it says, am I coming? And the last thing we need to talk about is capitalization. And these rules are in your book if you need to review them. But in Greek, as in English, we capitalize a proper name. We capitalize the beginning of a quotation and we capitalize the beginning of a paragraph. What we don't do is capitalize the beginning of an ordinary sentence. And you can see that up here in this erkomai. Remember that it was a complete sentence with a period at the end, but we have a lowercase epsilon to begin it. Now again, if you forget any of the, these rules, you can refer back to this video or look at page six of your book. So that's the Greek alphabet. Congratulations. Now you're ready to try the exercises at the end of the chapter. And you can read some of them along with me in the next video.